This Week in Parasitism is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at microbeworld.org slash twip. This Week in Parasitism, episode number 56, recorded on July 1st, 2013. Hi everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello, and with me is a cheery Dixon, De Pommier. Hello Vincent. How are you on this formerly rainy day, but now quite nice? Uh, we had a drenching downpour earlier today, and I got half of myself wet. And the other half was totally dry because I was mm-hmm. I had a smaller umbrella than I should have. <laughs> Actually, it is very cloudy still, but the rain is gone, right? I, the rain is gone for the moment. That is true. That is true. Now, with all this rain, yes. what will happen to the mosquitoes? Well, of course they'll they'll be overjoyed, <laughs> but they're getting a lot of. And they'll be keep biting the birds because the birds will be around. And it's been coolish. Because there's water. It hasn't hit ninety degrees or more yet. Yeah. So not so, a big West Nile summer? I don't think so. I think you're going to have a nice, quiet summer. We've this, had a lot of rain this summer. Right? We have, but if you go beyond the Mississippi River, if you go is out it west, dry? it is not just dry out there. It's hotter than you know what. It's hotter than blazes. But uh, are, is this drought of last summer still uh, ongoing in the West? It is. It yeah. is. And it's still centered over Oklahoma, Texas, and portions of, uh, of Kansas. Hmm. So, yes, uh, droughts don't get wiped out just by single downpours, basically. So, how have you been, Dixon? Been well, thank you. I just got back from Strasbourg. 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 The last time we twipped yes. was on 14th of June. That's true. It was about two weeks ago. Yeah. We did the Ladybird episode. We did. Did you happen to notice the image that I used? For the episode? No, here it is. Look. <laughs> no, I, I it's noticed It's a nice it. collection of ladybirds. I just noticed it. I, I listened to it. I actually uh, listened to it. This is a nice picture of the different variants of the harlequin ladybird. So exactly. I found that online. Check that out. Very nice. Now, last time, if you remember, yes. and since <clears throat> you might not remember, let me refresh your... <laughs> Fading memory. <laughs> memory. We had a letter from a listener. Yes. Who uh, who's who was from uh, Rocky Mountain Laboratories? All oh, right, in Hamilton, Montana. I know exactly where that is. Who's uh, this? This writer Nial was a is an angler, and his father or her father um, is the local fisheries biologist. Right, which I for, have to make a connection to. Sometime yeah, you should. Soon. I will. Uh, and this listener wanted to hear more about whirling disease. Well, okay. Is that like the uh, Turkish whirling dervish? I have no idea. Uh, I'd never heard of... Because that's illegal, by the way. I'd you know. never heard of whirling <laughs> disease. I've heard of it. And you uh, got very excited. Yeah, I've heard of it. And said, let's do it next time. Sure. So today, we're going to start whirling. Yep, we are. Which direction would you like to go in, Vince? Clockwise or counterclockwise? You're, 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 <laughs> it depends whether you're above or below the equator, right? Uh, that's a Coriolis effect. That has nothing to do so with it. So do you flying. know a Coriolis effect? Yeah. Okay. Do you know anything about whirling disease? I do. Are you going to make it up? No. Well, All right. a little bit. First <laughs> question is, should I get the book? Nope. It's not in there. No, it's not in there. It's not a disease of humans. That's correct. But it is a parasitic disease. It is. And I presume it's of fish. Correct. Now, why would you know anything about this? Well, because it attacks salmonids. Mostly Salmonids? Is it a trout of salmonid? It is. It is. That just took a while to guess. Yeah. <laughs> Why is it trout of salmon? <clears throat> well, it's related to a group of organisms that has its um, origins some 20,000 years ago uh, during the retreat of the glaciers during the last ice age. But salmonids do? Mm-hmm. Yeah, they didn't exist before that. And they spread out in a uh, circumpolar region as the glaciers retreated. Mm-hmm. And as the, um, the access to fresh water... Uh, regions uh, began to get cut off by land bridges and landslides and yeah. earthquakes and stuff like this. It trapped a whole bunch of progenitors of today's modern trouts and chars, mm-hmm. 
trouts and chars, basically. That's the white fishes. Line. White fishes in there too. Gray That's wings. Right. A lot of things. Anything with salmon an, with an adipose fin and scales. What's an adipose fin? It's a fat containing projection off the back of the trout or salmonid just before the tail. Is it the same as a ray fin? <clears throat> no. doesn't have any uh, rays in it whatsoever. Because it says here, sam- salmonidae are a family of ray finned fish. True. Their fins have rays in them. Okay. But the adipose, which is a, uh, a fat deposit. Uh, which fin is that on the reserve. back? It's on the back just before the tail. What is that called on the back? The caudal. Caudal fin. Yep. All right. I, I know my fins. <laughs> In fact, I know all the Scandinavians. <laughs> that was a bad joke. Very bad. Sorry. Not worthy of Alan Dove. Uh, Alan, you know, it's a good thing I'm not in competition with him because I'd be a loser. Good thing he doesn't listen to Twip. It is a good thing, actually, because he'd have much better things to say about these things than we do. So this whirling disease Perhaps. is a disease of salmonids. 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 That's correct. And no, no other fish or no no other living thing on earth gets this whirling disease. That's, well, they don't get the disease, but there is an intermediate host. So there is a, it's a two-host parasite. Well, what is the parasite, first of all? Right. Should we start there? I think we Stop should. Stop banging on the desk. It's making a lot of noise. You I know, know you get enthusiastic. I do. I do. I do. I can't You can't eat it. your yogurt now. I'm not going to. I'm going to put everything down so it doesn't fall over and make if, a noise. After the show, we can eat our yogurts together. Okay? Oh, that would be delightful, in uh, fact. Your banana's a little green here. Oh, well, you know what? You don't mind? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. At my age, you should only eat green bananas. So, whirling disease... Let's start with the parasite. Well, let's start with the observations first. Why is it whirling? Do right. the fish go around in circles? They do. In fact, they do. Really? They do. That's mm. why it's called whirling disease. And it was first noted back in 1903. Okay. The That's, disease? Well, the organism. And it's a European of European origin. And it infects European salmonids. So... Maybe we should just start off by saying what what European salmonids are in terms of their groups, okay? Very the, well. The parent stock for salmonids is Salmo solar, which is the Atlantic salmon, mm-hmm. okay? And you can find it both in the New World, which we are, North America, and in Europe, and particularly in Scandinavia and the British Isles, okay? And it's a it's the premier game fish of freshwater fishing people in the north. These are, so these salmonids, are they all freshwater fish? Well, they're anandromous. <laughs> yeah, does that mean they have two sexes or something? Uh, no, no, they, they do have two sexes, but that's, that's not what anandromous means. Anandromous means that they live most of their adult lives okay. in salt water, but they spawn in freshwater. So they go inland to spawn. They do. And in most of the other times, they're out at the sea or this is correct. fresh water. Are there, are there salt water uh, rivers? And that, no, really. Not, none. The Hudson is salt only up to a certain point. No, right? It's an estuary. That's how they would define that. It's yeah. brackish water. It's okay. Brackish. It's salty, but not salt. Right. Now, uh, Vincent, mm. do you think that we have anandromous fish here that are not salmonids? <laughs> I have no idea. But I'm well, going to say yes because your your eyes are bulging. <laughs> well, you love to do this on Twiv to me, so I I have a time. This, this is, is your turn. I am relishing in all of this. This may take three hours. All right. <laughs> let, let me just so salmonids, which include trouts, chars, freshwater whitefishes, graylings, they're all androgynous. I can't say the word that you said. <laughs> and drum. No. Now you've got me stumped. And anandromous. 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 No, they're not all anandromous. Uh, anandromous fish. Some salmonids are anandromous and some are not. Many types of fish migrate on a regular basis. That's true. So not the whitefish fish. don't. The grayling don't. But the chars and the trouts and the salmons do. And an- anadromous are diadromous fishes, which spend most of their lives in the sea and migrate to fresh water. But then there are the diadromous, which are truly migratory fishes, which migrate between the sea and fresh water. Right. Right. Anyway, we'll just stick to uh, anadromous. <laughs> anadromous. So, so no, sal- there's no N. It's anadromous. 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 Okay, you need fine. a pronunciation uh, okay, fine. help there? Okay. Anadromous. Anadromous. Okay. So... 
the salmon, the salmon salar. Did you is, answer my question, by the way? Not, uh, did sure. I answer, or did anyone answer your question, which is, other than salmonids, are there other fish that right. can get spawn you, in fresh water and live in salt water? Can you think of any? Uh, and the, you can find them right out here in the Hudson River. Striped bass? Correct. Uh, and that's all I know. It's in the Hudson River. I know people used to fish for stripers here. They still do. Bluefish? No. no. Bluefish stay in the ocean, they right? They do. What about Shad. Shad used to be a rock group, right? <laughs> I don't know that. Shad is a great name. I think it is. Shad also migrate into freshwater to spawn. Are they good eating fish? They're wonderful. If you go to a restaurant, you never see shad on the menu, you, though. You do when you go in the spring. You should, it's turning it. into this week in fish. <laughs> no, but which is in fact a, a podcast we should do. Know your host. <laughs> <laughs> Shad, okay, or anadromous, what else? Yeah. Well, then there's another kind of fish that Mackerel? lives. Mackerel? No, wait. Pike? There are, Char? You want, you want to name them all? <laughs> you know, there's a whole of fishes at the Museum of Natural History. That I should I, go to see it, actually. I used to hang out in that place a lot. I should learn about fishes. They're great. Fishes, they have lots of viruses, too, Vince. Lots I know. of viruses. I know. So, um, there's another kind of fish, though, that lives in freshwater and spawns in saltwater. All right. It's the opposite. And what's that called? Cadandromous. Canadromous? Yeah. Cadaverous? No, no, cadandromous. Cada- Here it is, catadromous. Okay, catadromous. Are, are diadromous fishes, which spend most of their lives in freshwater and migrate to the sea to breed. And one of them is the eel. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, eels are so cool. So European eels and American eels are found in freshwater. And when they spawn, they both migrate to the ocean to the Sargasso Sea which is off the That's coast right. of Florida I, when my kids were young I had a book <clears throat> a little book about eels a story about eels migrating yeah yeah and when they when they mm-hmm. migrate they never intermingle American eels spawn with American eels and European eels spawn mm-hmm. with American and then they go back to their freshwater haunts they do they do they're amazing now now my we used to catch eels uh, at the Jersey Shore. Correct. Right off the dock. Yeah. In salt water. And they're on their way to the. Oh, they're on their way. They're on their way. They're kind of lost if they're there. No, no, no. It's on the way. They probably came out of the Raritan River. So they live in the mud. They don't live in the mud, of course not. They're fish. All right. They live in rivers, freshwater rivers, and then they, on their way to the Sargasso, they get caught. They still eat. What the about way. gars? Gars. That's an interesting question. Gars are air breathers, so it really doesn't matter where they live. The reason that gars are cool is because if you stand on a dock, you can often see them swimming at the surface. This is true. Most fish don't come up Where that did high. you see gars? At the Jersey Shore. Gars? Yes, all the time, right off the dock. Get out. The dock of the bay. Really? So there is a barrier beach on the coast of New Jersey. It's quite a long barrier beach, all right? Many of the coastal towns it's are there. It's the upper reaches for the gar. And between the barrier and the mainland, there's a long bay. It's called Barnegat Bay. Barnegat Bay, I know that bay. And there well. I see gars, and oh, you can catch gar. eels in there. Gar. As a kid, I grew <laughs> up in the south, Yeah. in New Orleans, and uh, along the Gulf Coast, you can see gar all over the place. All right. So they're both fresh and saltwater. That, that fish can live in both. Gar can do both also? They can. Which one are they? Anadromous or cadadromous? Uh, they're neither, neither nor. <laughs> Were they spawn they're, or do they mate in uh, salt I, I don't know yeah. a lot about gar, but I know that you can find them in both salt Can water. you eat gar? I've never done that. They have a long nose. They do. They're cool. They're, they're, well, some of them are called alligator gar because they almost look like an alligator. Uh-huh. They get up to 10 feet long bones. Cool. They're huge. All right, so back to the salmonids with whirling disease. Correct. So uh, now I see why you wanted to do this one. I get to talk about fish. <laughs> well, of course, <laughs> which is fine. <laughs> Not so bad. So it began as a disease that was described first in the early 1900s, and then in, what was it described in fish? Uh, yeah, sure, because it's so, a parasite but of back fish. then they didn't do. Um, uh, what do you, farming of fish? So this must that's have been, not true. They did, of course. So was the disease first uh, described in wild fish or farmed? That's fish? That's a very good question. I don't know the exact answer to that. So perhaps right. we can poll our uh, our listeners and ask them to uh, supply that as an answer. Well, I have here a uh, a website on this disease. It was yeah, first well, described in rainbow trout in Germany 100 years ago. Right. Well, wait, wait, wait. I raised this my disease, hand. Disease whirling disease. I'm going to raise my hand now. So. 
rainbow trout in Germany. That's what it says. I know it does say that, but let's let's think about that a minute, the shall disease we? Disease is in fact both farmed and wild fish population. How did how did rainbow trout get to Germany, Vincent? Why wouldn't it be there? Oh, but I will tell you why. Is See, this is the there? part that I know. Where, they, where, where, where what's the natural habitat of rainbow trout? The range of naturally occurring Oncorhynchus mycus, which right. is the name of this organism, is found on the western slopes of the Rocky Mountains only. only. And the Pacific Rim. You can find them also in Kamchatka. But they're, if you draw the line around where they're found, it's a Pacific Coast only fish. Until, of course, we elected to bring them to other places. So they're such a favorite <coughs> fish they are. that they are brought elsewhere. And they are. They're, they're, they're seeded into various waters. They're valued they for their food and for their sporting ability to jump can you, in. When you go to Pennsylvania to fish, can you get rainbow trout? Oh, sure. That's because they uh, stock the ponds, right? That's, but they have now naturally reproducing populations of rainbow trout in uh, the east. Mm -hmm. So the, the habitat suits them. That's correct. They can overwinter? Sure. No problem. They go down deeper and they don't freeze. They don't freeze. Wow. They hang out at the spring holes. What's that? Um, well, the rivers... <laughs> this is it takes take three hours, right? Perhaps another topic. But, but every river, as it goes down its gradient, from a very steep gradient to a very shallow gradient, yeah. it, it, it's fed by a number of springs that actually come into the river because the aquifers are interrupted right. by the geology. So those springs run at the same temperature all year. So in the summertime, they cool the rivers. Mm -hmm. In the wintertime, they heat the rivers. Imagine being All heated right. up to 51 degrees. That's where they go because the temperature is basically the same in both places. Okay. So the rainbow trout were brought to Germany. As eggs. As eggs, and they're put in the ponds and, they were and the streams. In, right. They were put on all over the place. But, so that people could fish them. Yeah, but they already had a trout there, though, you'll see. What trout was that? That was salmon. The sour trout? <laughs> That was great. That was very good. That was excellent. <laughs> you you rolled your eyes though. <laughs> I rolled more than that. I can tell you. <laughs> that was a good one. That was a very good one. No, the the trout that was already there, the native trout, for Europe, is called Salmo trutta, which is the brown trout. Is it good? In fact, it's wonderful. It's a great sport fish and also good eating. It's very good eating too. Okay. So why would you want to bring a trout into a, an area that, when you already had them? That is a, could be an invasive species, it right? It is an invasive species. When you do that, it's an invasive species. So, so wait a second now. This is getting complicated because now we've got a story in which whirling disease was never a disease of New World salmonids. Never a disease, okay? It was found in Europe and restricted to Europe until the 1950s. And then something awful happened. <laughs> mm hmm I guess we had the need to import from Europe rainbow trout, which we, of course, imported from the United States to Europe, exported, imported, I should say. Yeah. So now we've got this reverse migration of rainbow trout coming from Europe back to the United States, perhaps to replace populations of fish that died from other things, like infectious peritonitis, for instance, or infectious pancreatitis, which is, by the way, a big viral disease of uh, salmonids as well, fish farmed uh, situations. So you've got, you've got the potential now for bringing an unwanted parasite, which was only present in Europe, mm -hmm. and infected brown trout, but didn't affect the brown trout. It uh, infected, but didn't affect. Mm -hmm. And that's a big difference, right? So brown trout, over the millennia, have come into balance with this parasite so that they're not affected by the parasite. I see. But rainbow trout, which had never encountered this parasite before, were not only highly susceptible to the infection, they were highly susceptible to the pathology of the right. microbe. So the, red, the rainbow trout, which were brought there from the U.S. Suffered greatly. And that's where they first detected the disease. Yes. But not the parasite, because the parasite had been there before. Correct. Interesting. So now they're going to bring this fish back with the parasite, in C2. And so that, re that introduced the parasite into the U.S. It did. It did. It says here that the range of the parasite has spread yes, to has. include yes. most of Europe, That's including right. Russia. Did you know that Russia is part of Europe? I did. Actually, right. I did know that. 
Yeah, we had a contest of a few. You know, weeks England ago. is not part of Europe. <laughs> we had a yeah, that's what I've been told. We had a contest in our family to name the number of countries in Europe, uh, and many right. people were astounded that Russia and many other countries are part of Europe. So Russia, Europe, Russia, the U.S., South Africa, and other countries as well. And how do you think that worked? The spread of the parasite. Yeah, not just by introducing fish with the parasite, but there's another way here. Water. No, not really. Uh, well, there's a second host. Ah. Uh, I look, you know, your light bulb just went on. When do we get to it talk just, about the life cycle? It just, well, because we're doing that right now. We're trying to tease out the life cycle by describing how you transmit this well, from let's, place let's, to let's place. Do, before we do that, let's sure. finish the whirling. Okay. So the disease was first picked up in Germany in a rainbow trout 100 years ago, and then it since has spread. Right. Do we want to say why it's called whirling disease? Or? Of course we do. No, we do. Uh, this is a parasite which infects very young fish. Juveniles. Very. Ju juvie fish. Juveniles. Okay. Y-O-Y. Y-O-Y. What's that stand for? Young of year. Young of year. Is that a, is that a common saying, Y-O-Y? It's a common okay. saying among fisheries biologists because when they, when they look for the cohorts mm -hmm. of fish in a river to see if it's doing okay, they can measure the size of the fish and tell you which year that was from. So what year does does the uh, parasite infect the fish? First year. year? One. First Have year. you ever seen a fish with whirling disease? Of course. In Pennsylvania? And, and out west also. I do a lot of fishing out in the western part. So you could just stand on the banks and look? And no, you, you won't see them like that. No? no when, no? when you catch them, you see it? Sometimes. All right. They don't all die from this. And they don't all whirl from this. This is a parasite that infects cartilage. Uh, a very young fish. Yes. All right. So it infects the uh, the surrounding tissues for their middle ear, which causes them to become disoriented. But it also affects the development of their backbone. Mm -hmm. And they get these little uh, notch. It looks like the backbone has been broken. And you can get this, by the way, in another way. When they do fish surveys, they use um, these large electrodes that are maybe 20 yards apart. One guy holds one, and another person holds the other. I didn't mean to say that the only men do this. Women do this, too. Mm -hmm. And they stick the electrodes in the water, and they run a current through the water, and anything between this two electrodes is uh, electroshocked. They're stunned. They're not killed, mm -hmm. but they're stunned. And they float up. And they float up down the river. So there's two guy, two people, two people. with a right. seine net down there to catch the fish that are right. stunned. And then they lift them out of the water and they measure them. They take scale samples. They, In other words, they do a stream survey this way. Got well, it. why a why fish that are less than two inches long, their backs are broken by the electric shock. Mm -hmm. And so when they repair... It gives the appearance of having been infected with... Their backs are broken, but they're still alive. They are still alive. And they throw them back and they heal? They throw everybody back. They don't even catch the little ones sometimes. They just escape from the nets because okay. the holes are too big. And so they repair. And when they repair and grow up to be a big fish, they've got a notch in the back tail. Mm -hmm. And you say, oh, that fish had whirling disease. Not necessarily. Could have been a victim of the electroshocking survey technique. So you've got to distinguish these two things, right? But... So whirling disease was introduced in the 50s in the United States. And I, I recall, because I was a student at Notre Dame, uh, Indiana had a lot of these uh, pay-for-fishing places, uh, ponds, and, and they had a lot of blue holes. A blue hole is a spring that comes up out of the ground because Indiana has lots of limestone deposits. Mm -hmm. And those blue holes are cold, clear, beautiful places to be. And so they've stocked them with fish. And you can go fish for these things. And, and I can remember visiting one of these hatcheries, and, and, and they were lamenting the fact that they had to now deal with this new disease called uh, whirling disease. And that was back in the early 1960s. And I, I think it was introduced just before that. And then it's a, since then, it's spread all over the place. So the point is that if whirling disease um, results in a fish that can only go in circles. I found a movie on YouTube. Yeah. You we'll put it? that up. Well, sure, of course I do, and we'll, I've probably seen this one before, but I, I enjoy seeing it again. Can you see that? I can, of course. So that's a trout, right? Yeah, uh, absolutely. It's going to swim in a second. Yeah. I guess they don't want to swim all the time. It's very sad, and you see the little stripes along the side. Those are par marks. Those are called par marks. See that? It's 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 horrible. It's I mean, spinning it, in circles. This is a fish. Oh that, my gosh! That wants to go straight, but it can't. Because it's totally disoriented, because its middle ear won't let it go. 
I would guess that this, these kinds of fish could be eaten by predators. No problem. Who, who eats trout anyway besides Other oh, trout. Really? Yes. Brown trout are cannibalistic. Uh-huh. So are rainbow trout are not as cannibalistic, but they will eat young trout. Mm-hmm. They will. When they're hungry, they'll, they'll hunt them down and, and eat them. So there's a, a big attrition between the time the eggs hatch and the time the adult trout are produced. About 1% survive to be adults, by the way. 1%? 1%. Of, infected. of all the ala- no, of all the eggs that are laid by a, a, a trout, only one percent will succeed as an adult. Okay. But in a hatcher, of course, many, many more. To so begin the with. reason for this aberrant swimming behavior is because the parasite, which we'll get to, has infected cartilage and muscle. Not muscle. Just cartilage. Yes. And it causes it to fu- malfunction. Correct. So the middle ear doesn't develop properly on oh, one side. It's a balance side, thing. It is a balance thing. It has nothing to do with mo- with muscle and cartilage. And- no, but if it infects the backbone and you get this break-like thing, then you get a tail that's crooked. Right. So even though the fish wants to swim straight, it's like a rudder yeah, so that won't turn back. F- f- tail. Okay. That's correct. So there are various manifestations of this. So that's what whirling disease means. Correct. Okay. All right. And, and by the way... Um, <clears throat> Does it kill them? Sometimes. It says here it can be kill up to 90% of infected populations, and those that do survive are <coughs> deformed. Right. They act as a reservoir for the parasite. Right. Pardon me, just for a moment. You're going to cough? Yeah, I am going to. So yeah, I have to find this section and edit it. Sorry about that, Vince. You don't have a cold. <coughs> Only when we do twip do you have to cough. I never hear you coughing any other time. <laughs> well, you're not listening. That's not true. I cough. Sometimes I leave your cough in to embarrass you. I, but I'm not embarrassed at that level. You can't do that. Actually, you aren't work. embarrassed by anything. Well, I, I'm embarrassed by making stupid mistakes. You, know, you are? Biochemistry, yeah, yeah. I'm embarrassed by that. I should but you don't better. show it. <laughs> well, you can't show it. Otherwise, I'll take advantage of you. <laughs> you have to pretend you know everything. That's the <laughs> the job of a professor. Um, okay, so uh, you're right. The attrition rate is very high in some cases, particularly in hatcheries. Okay. Mm-hmm. So how would uh, so sometimes it the parasite will get into a hatchery, and that's a problem. A huge problem. And they have to kill all the fish, cull them to get rid of it. They do. And replace all the water. Exactly. Well, the water isn't exactly the problem here, is it? Well, I don't know, but I sense it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the intermediate host that we're worried about here. And the intermediate host, in this case, turns out to be an invertebrate. It's a worm. It's called Tubifex. Tubifex is, is what yeah. I used to feed my tropical fish. What do you mean used to? You can still do that. Uh, I used to because I don't have fish anymore. So the name of this organism is easy to remember because it's Tubifex, Tubifex. <laughs> it's like really? Loa, Loa. Yeah. Sure. So it's stupefacts, stupefacts. Well, by the way, the uh, parasite of um, whirling disease. Yes. What is it called? It's called Mixobolus cerebralis. Mixobolus or Mixobolus? Mixobolus. Mixobolus. I've heard Mixobolus. Mostly. Cerebralis. Yeah. Which And that name tells me that they thought it might have gone in the brain at it one does. point. It does. Well, that's where the inner ear for the trout is. Remember, I told you the cartilage surrounding yeah. the middle ear. That's, so that's, that's what that results. And, okay, in, in our classification <coughs> of parasites. Ah, uh, this is the tough part. Now is you, this multicellular? It is. It turns out to be a mixosporidium. You go look that up, and it's hard to find out what that is. Yeah. A mixosporidium. And mixosporidity are mesozoans. What does that mean? Well, there's protozoans. Right. Mesozoans. And metazoans. Bingo. So what's a mesozoan? It's a a multicellular organism, but it's got very few cells. Okay. And what is that? What is very few? Two or three? There are some examples. I'll give you some examples. Um, Nidaria. How do you spell Nidaria? C-N-I-D. E R I A. So the uh, A R I A. So the C is silent. <laughs> yeah, he's got it I'm in just front looking at That's it's, not fun. <laughs> the C is silent. Yeah, it is. Uh, well, the, look, if I don't correct you, someone's going to write in and correct this is you. Who would you rather do? No, I'd rather hear from them. I want to know who's listening. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then there are bryozoa. So bryozoa is part of this group. How many well. cells do these uh, it varies. Mixobo- mixobolus have? It varies. I tried to find that out and I couldn't get an exact count. Less than C. elegans? Oh, gosh, yes. Which, how many cells do C. elegans have? That's a very good question. I think it's in the 300-some-ons. Mm. 380, I think that's probably right. 
No. I know it has 19,026 genes, but uh, the number of cells, it's in the 300s, as I recall. Hmm. I'm looking it up. Yeah, you'll find it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a nematode. That's to compare it's to. It's different, but I just want to get a sense for C. elegans number of cells. I want right. to see, but this is going to be less complicated. Well, much though. less complicated. 959 900. somatic cells. Oh, wow. And then, I it has some, a lot. then it has some germ cells I'm, as well. I take it all back. So um, the myxobolus has less than 1,000, probably oh, a few hundred or... Maybe even 10 or 20. Okay. I mean, so these are primitive. This is like... It's a very interesting morphologically, uh, yes. do you know? This is like a triskelion. It's got two different forms in Look. its life. I know, I know, I know. It looks like a, a little anchor that you would throw. That's a great way to think about this, because that's how they gain entrance into their host. So this is made up of three cells. That's right. They look at the nuclei there. Yes. And then it's, uh, it's got a little thing called the polar capsule at the bottom. It has hooks. Sure, sure. So I would guess that each of those hooks is a single cell. I would. Right? I would. Maybe there are a couple more cells down here. And there's... There's something called spirogony, and there's something called gamma uh, microgametocytes. Yeah, it, it 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 they use terminology that we've already talked about with regards to the malarial parasites. Mm -hmm. All right. So they thought for many many years that, that this was a protozoan because they couldn't really distinguish how many cells it had. Mm -hmm. Nor did they know that it had a two-host uh, life cycle. But now they so know. one host is the fish yes. and a salmonid, and the other right. is, is a tubifex worm. Correct. Which only lives in fresh water, by the way. A tubifex so worm. So remember, these organisms, these salmonids, all spawn in fresh water. Yeah. So when the eggs hatch, okay, and the tubifex worms are found next to the eggs. I call them tubificid worms. Tub tubificid. Tubificid. No, no, tubificid worms, there are numbers of species. Tubifex, tubifex, you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, gee, for once. <laughs> I wasn't bad at invertebrate zoology. Life cycle. That's, actually, I was at that website last night. You were doing work last night for the show? I, I'm stunned. <laughs> Vincent, this is totally out of my... Local area oh, that's of expertise. What it takes for you to do some work, huh? Well, if I'm confident <laughs> of the information, I don't have to do too much work, like you with so viruses. So with polio, you would say I won't have to do any work. No, you just have to do some, but you wouldn't have, have to review to. the entire literature. Of course. But with this, this I tried to find out even what it was, and it was hard to get the information. By the way, it's not a readily available piece of information. What um, the, the the parasite yeah, is? You I had to go to a um, an embol paper in mm -hmm. Europe to find out how they de defined this organism by its uh, S18 uh, RNA. And it has resemblances this between... Is a kind, this is a ribosomal RNA. Yeah, nematodes, uh, nidaria, bryophytes. Bryophyte. <clears throat> yeah, that's another total, another group of invertebrates that are mesozoans. And so this organism may form an entire phylum all by itself. Mm -hmm. That's the possibility here. Uh, the tree of life has many branches. All right, so these are only in fresh... The The actual organism mm -hmm. is in tube effects, which is a reservoir host? No, no, it's an intermediate host. All right. So these uh, organisms, do they exist free-living in the water? No. They either infect the tube effects or, or the they fish. infect the fish. They're not the floating fish. around in the water. Well, they are floating around looking for a fish. Okay. Let's right. go through the life cycle. <laughs> Difficult. Why? It took a long time for them to. So we start this. with this this triskelion like thing is called a triactinomyxon. Right. I can barely say that. Right. <laughs> That's the mature phase of the parasite. Yes. And this is the phase that will infect the fish. How does it get into the fish? It sticks to the outside and burrows its way through. Wow. I know. So this would prefer fish that are sitting, standing still, right? Yes, but these are, remember, these are tiny little fish at this point. Very small. They still have their egg sacs, perhaps. So does a small <coughs> fish have a more permeable skin than an older fish? Certainly. So these, these triactos couldn't get into an adult fish? No. What if they went in the mouth? Could they get in the gills? No. No? No, they penetrate directly through the skin. All right, so they attach to a little fish. Right. Burrow in. Yes. And where do they go? Ah, then they go to the cartilage. These these triskelions, which I'm calling them. Well, then they... <laughs> they're very small. Yes. Can you see them with the naked eye? Of course not. 
That's why they thought they were protozoans. For many years, they thought these were protozoans. It's a very pretty form, though, isn't it's very it? Very pretty. You have to admit. Very pretty. There Symmetry are, is often pretty. I agree with you. There's some amoebae that build tests, and uh, they live inside of these little tests, which are little houses, and they right. look very much like that. And, uh, and this is these are in the water, yes. and they attach to a little fish, and they get into the cartilage, basically. Yes. It says here they're infected via the epithelium or through ingesting... Well, Infected tubifices. Ah. Ah. Eh, worms. Ah. So if the fish grows a little bit more, mm-hmm. it starts to feed off the local fauna of the stuff that it's sure. got in front of it. Bottom. So it starts, and it could acquire this through the ingestion of a tubifex. So the tubifex would have this triskelion <coughs> stage? Sure. I've introduced a it's new where terminology. That's where it came from. <laughs> so the tubifex have the trilobed uh, parasites? They produce them. So... As they're produced, they either exit the tube effects as the tube effects dies and releases these into the water column, or the tube effects worm is eaten. It says here they release cysts also. Well, I think the dead fish release cysts. Well, the, see, there are two kinds of cysts. The spores uh, are produced in the cartilage. Right. And they are released. And right. you see a picture of the Which spore then infects here. the uh, tube effects worm. And the tube effects worm. Um, also, the spores are released on death of the fish. Right. And then the tube effects, because otherwise, how would it get from the cartilage to uh, exactly. out, right? Exactly. And then the worms, why? They pick up the spores? I guess. Why are the worms eating spores? I think they're filter feeders. And then um, it says here, the sporocytes containing eight triactinomyxons are produced. So there are eight of the, the, the triacto guys and the spores produced by the worms. And those um, are released. Are released. So or in the worm, they're matured and released as mature triactinocytes. <laughs> triactinocytes. <laughs> very well. <laughs> oh, I'm just reading the picture. No, no, here. of course. It's complicated, though, because for many, many years, people didn't believe this was a parasite, first of all. And they didn't believe it was a, not a protozoan. They thought it was mm-hmm. a protozoan. So they were looking for all of the uh, features of organisms that didn't really match with what they had. Interesting idea that this goes through a worm, isn't it? Oh, yeah. I guess that's because the the worms are filter feeders and the fish eat the worms. Yep. So it's adapted to this. Exactly. Now, they say here that birds can act as vectors between water bodies. Sure. In particular, piscivorous. Are those birds that eat fish? Uh, Yes, they are. Piscivorous? Yes, they are. Piscivores. So a bird, yeah, I've seen birds pick fish up, yeah. Right. And they don't all survive. I mean, they don't all get eaten. Sometimes the fish is dropped, right? right? Or the feet of the bird themselves can have the eggs of the tubifex. So they can deliver tubifex worms to various places mm-hmm. as well. And I presume also because the fish may have eaten tubifex. And then you've got a dead fish that drops out of the mouth of, let's say, a kingfisher or, you know... A, the birds do not get infected. They don't get infected. So how do they act as vectors? They're mechanical vectors. They're taking pieces of fish from one water body to another. Yeah, they're mechanical vectors. Have you seen birds carrying fish out of the water? I have a picture that I will bring in, Vince. Maybe we can put it up on the web. I was in the Everglades, and I, w- I witnessed a um, an osprey fly out of the woods with a Jack Gravel in its talons, and I got the picture. And What's you can a tell, Jack Gravel? You have to look that one up. <laughs> now, a it's a saltwater fish. A, uh, osprey is a, is a, is a, a fish eating bird. Yeah, you have them down at the Barnegat Bay. I know you do. Yeah. And they've got talons that are almost circles of claws. What did you call that? A Jack what? A, a, a Jack Gravel. Jack Gravel. C-R-E. Yeah. Jack Gravel. Yeah. Wow. They're good eating. That is a big fish. Uh, well, it can be, of course. This fish was only about... It's a common jack. It is. And this hmm. osprey had hooked one in the uh, Everglades. Was it big compared it was, to the osprey? It, well, you'll see the picture. I'll bring it in and I'll show it to you. I was very proud you, of it. You Everything can was, email it. You don't have to bring anything anymore. <laughs> <laughs> right? That's true, actually. <laughs> do you have it as a digital version? I do. Of course I do. So you took this as it flew over. It was on a touring boat through the uh, Everglades. Cool. And, out from the Everglades flies it. You just do that and hopefully you get the best. And it was in perfect focus and everything. Was, yeah, that's rare. It was very rare. But I, I did see a bird do this. Actually, I've witnessed these birds do this also. You All can right, actually so watch them do it. This salmonid. That's so we cycle. have this. They have this cycle down. Mm-hmm. So that means that tubifex worms are probably found 
throughout the freshwater world. Right. Okay. But salmonids are not found throughout the freshwater world. In fact, remember, I think we've been talking about this as a casual comments about my um, obsessive hobby of trout fishing, that if you uh, drew a line around the earth and called it the equator, which we've done, <laughs> then <laughs> yes. no salmonids are found south of the equator naturally. But if we bring them across... We've done that, of course. Will they survive south oh, of the equator? Some of the best fishing places in the world are in the southern hemisphere. Uh, Patagonia in South America and New Zealand. We've talked about that, too. So you can find them all over the place. I'm yeah. showing Dixon the worldwide distribution of this parasite. Right. It's in so North, North South America. Um, South, South Africa is certainly below South the equator. Africa. What country is this in South America, just Those below? Peru and Ecuador. Peru is up here? They're not below the equator. Okay. They're but on, not South Af South America doesn't mostly... Doesn't not yet. They've it. been very lucky. Nothing in Australia, Southeast Asia. They're lucky. And but look over here. Oh, that's part of um, New, New Zealand, Zealand, right? The South Island of New Zealand has got whirling disease. Interesting. Very. But not the North Island. Exactly. Well, if Russia has whirling disease. Now, why would... Look at that. The whole country is full of it. Why? Exactly. We have many, many, many rivers, many salmonids. Scandinavia like. here. Yeah, sure. It's a big disease there. So do they like fish in Russia? It's a big infection. It's not a big disease. Got it. This is just the distribution of the parasite. Correct. M. cerebralis. Yeah. Right. So when it was brought to the United States in the 50s, and then it began to spread by so whatever we have, mechanisms. We have it now in the U.S. You have witnessed it. I have witnessed so it. So you've caught fish which are deformed. Yes. Okay. Not only that, uh, the Madison River, which is one of the premier fishing places in Montana, yeah. and which comes out of um, Yellowstone Park, there are three... Uh, rivers that they call presidential rivers, but actually mm -hmm. I just know of only two. <laughs> That's the Jefferson and the Madison, and then the Yellowstone. And when they hook up together, all three of them, they form the Missouri. Okay. All right? And ironically, or not ironically, I guess crazily, they begin as rivers uh, that flow first to the northwest, and then they circle to the north, and then they circle to the east, and then they go to the south. When whirling disease was first introduced... By we don't know how, into the Madison River. It was largely a rainbow trout fishery. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's interesting, though, because the Madison River is not on the western slopes of the Rockies, which means that the rainbow trout were introduced into the Madison. Okay? Got it. So what trout was there before that? The brown trout? No. That's an introduced species also. The wall-eyed trout. That's not a trout. <laughs> no, there was a trout. It was called the cutthroat trout. Cutthroat trout. Cutthroat trout. There's an eastern and a western slope cutthroat. Right. And the name of that is Oncorhynchus clarkii, named after Clark, of mm -hmm. Lewis and Clark. Okay. <laughs> it's true. Nice. Yeah. So that was the trout that was already there. Mm. Okay. There were no char. Uh, take it back. There was a char. It was called okay. bull trout. So they had bull trout and they had um, cutthroat trout, but they had no brown trout and they had no rainbow trout until they were introduced. Those two species of fish were introduced from various places. The brown trout had to come from Europe. Oh, now wait a minute. The brown trout came from Europe. Right. The brown trout had adapted to this parasite, just like the birds mm -hmm. in Africa had adapted to the West Nile virus. Correct. So they didn't suffer from it, but they carried it. Mm-hmm. The rainbow trout had never seen it before. They had no genes to resist this thing. Right. So they were decimated. Not decimated. No, not decimated. It was 90% loss. All right? The it's decimal point was the 10% yeah. that survived. So when the trout were then brought back from Europe, loaded with, with uh, the, uh, uh, the, the mixobolus, mm -hmm. cerebralis, <clears throat> the brown trout... Just thumb their little fins at it because they right. were already resistant. Right. So the trout population in the huh. in the Madison River over a ten year period went from like seventy percent rainbows, thirty percent brown trout to ninety percent brown trout, ten percent rainbow trout. And as it turns out, uh, to a common fisher person, it turns out the rainbow trout are easier to catch. Uh, they're more gullible. They live in uh, they live in a different uh, location in the river than the brown trout. The brown trout are cagier. They're they're thought of as the gold standard for uh, 
for um, the, the amount of cunning and guile that a fisherman needs in order to catch one. <laughs> Whereas the brown trout, or the rainbow trout, rather, are everybody's species, everybody likes catching them, and they also taste good. So what do you think happened over a period of 20 years, Vince, since the Portland disease has been introduced to the Madison River? What do you think happened to the populations over that time? Um, I, I would say that the fish have evolved to become more resistant. Yes. Is that true? It certainly is. It certainly is. Yeah, so probably it killed a lot of them, but the survivors had increased resistance and those passed on their genes. So now what's the ratio of rainbow trout to brown trout in the Madison River? We could actually type that out and find out because there are fisheries biologists that measure that daily. Are you serious? I'm dead serious. Ratio rainbow to brown trout Madison River. River. Right. Hmm. Wow. What do you get? Wow. What's well, this Holter Dam? What does he get? Oh, that's the Ma- that's not the Madison River. Because at the Holter Dam, it's six to one rainbow. That's in the Missouri. Brown. That's in the Missouri. Yeah. But that's okay, because they had whirling disease, too. So now it's back up to where it was before. Mm-hmm. Right? Because the rainbow trout is more adapted to United States waters mm-hmm. compared to the brown trout, which comes from Europe. All right, so it's taken them a long time to adapt. In fact, brown trout were introduced to this country in 1873 in Michigan, of all places. So that, and from that mm-hmm. point, they've spread out through the entire country. So it's interesting to look at population dynamics. I mean, you know, this parasite taught us a lot about invasive species, resistance to infection, um, changes in population densities for various species of things. Forget about what you're studying. Uh, many, many graduate theses were dedicated to this whirling disease once the economics was realized. Okay, sport fishing is a huge sport. <laughs> mm-hmm. it's, in the most, it's in the most proactive sport in America except for bowling. You're kidding. What do you, why is that? Because it's easy to do it. Okay. If you looked up and you can do this now. How much money do you think is generated every year through trout fishing? Just do trout fishing. The, the, um, the economics of trout fishing. How much money do you think is generated in this country every year just by trout fishing? A million dollars. A million dollars? <laughs> At a B. It's, it's in about 20 or the 30 billion dollars. American industry. Fly Fishing Trade Association. Yeah, and what does it say? Yeah, it says, we want your money. No, it has to tell you how much money. No, it doesn't tell me how much uh, money. You can find out, though. And, and it's estimated through Trout Unlimited that it's about a $20 billion industry. Wow. And that means motels, hotels, guide services, equipment, travel, all that stuff has to be added in to, to, to find out how much money people spend on trout fishing. So it's a huge business. I mean, it's an enormous business. And so when you've got something threatening that business, like a disease... Yeah, people start to throw up their hands and say, what are we going to do? So in the 1970s, the Whirling Disease Foundation was established Mm -hmm. to try to, what can we do about this? And I kept kept telling these people, I said, just wait. All you have to do is wait. What are you worried about? I'm a fisherman too. I'm concerned about this. But there's only one thing that's going to result here, and that is that you'll have a resistant population of rainbow trout that comes about as the result Mm -hmm. of this disease. And none of them were willing to believe me. And one of them was a virologist. And he should have known better because he's seen the way viruses behave and that's the way they behave and that's the way people behave. Mutation rates, it's an arms race all the way through, right? We've talked about this numerous times in our programs. And so 20 years down the road now, maybe even longer than that, uh, we've got whirling disease. We've still got it. But it affects a very, very small proportion of each uh, population of trout because, for the most part, they've become resistant. Wow. Now then. Uh, so you're, gonna, you're saying it's no longer an issue? It's an issue if you run a hatchery. But if you're worried about the fish in the wild, they're going to take care of themselves. So if you're supplying fish for dinners, right, yeah. as a commercial outfit, then you're worried about attrition. And if you get 90% attrition, of course, that's not a business anymore. Then you're out of business, right? What is the biggest uh, business in Salmonids that you can think of now? Salmon farms. Right. right. Exactly right. Which are all offshore, is that right? Well, many of them are. 
Many of them mm-hmm. are. They're but in they're, pens, right? But they're in the ocean. That's right. But they've got other disease problems, too. Sure. And, that, and the commercial fishermen are busy annoying the heck out of the sports fishermen because they're worried about domesticated salmon breeding with wild salmon and then lowering the fitness for mm-hmm. that river because only the wild salmon survive. So could the salmon that are bred offshore be infected with this parasite? Not likely. Because the tube effects worms don't live out there, right? Exactly right. They're and, freshwater, and then and then they're freshwater too. Wait, let me let me get something cleared up here now. Sure. The tube effects are in freshwater, so the salmon only go to freshwater to spawn, right? That's correct. They lay their eggs in the freshwater, they, and then well, they go. Not in the water. They dig a hole with their fins, with their oh. tail, and they leave the eggs behind, and they go back out into the ocean. Then the eggs hatch into little guys. And then they get infected by these parasites. That's correct. Now, that's on the East Coast. Salmon on the East Coast can spawn three different times before they die. And then the the youngs, when do they go out into the ocean? Well, they go through a series of developmental stages. And they start out as what they would call par. Mm -hmm. Okay? And then they grow further into something called a smolt. And then they get bigger than that, they're off. Ah, so they're in the fresh water for a while, so they there's are. ample opportunity to oh, be infected. Yeah. Oh, sure. Okay. Absolutely. There's a very nice description of the infection here at Wikipedia. Did you read it last night? I did, of course. How the, the, the various forms get into the yeah. fish and hatch. We'll put a link to that. Sure. It's kind Assuming of that it's accurate. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> you know. Probably someone who knows this. Uh, I don't yeah. know if you could make this stuff up, you know. Hard. <laughs> it's, but people do it anyway. <laughs> I'm sure they had explanations for this before they actually found out what was going on. It's interesting. They say they can diagnose it by PCR. Right. For this ribosomal RNA gene. Yeah. That's what you are talking about before. Yeah, the ATS. And uh, if you find that your fishery has got this uh, parasite, what do you do? Ah, uh, that's right. What do you do? What do you do? Um, <laughs> they have some it, drugs, apparently. It has... Yeah, well, that hasn't been very effective, it's though. It's either in development, yeah. And there might be vaccines that you could apply. There might be some genetic manipulations. Uh, you know, a whole bunch of things are thought about. But the best thing is to use resistant stocks of fish. Mm-hmm. So if you go to Europe, for instance, you'll find that the brown trout are perfectly healthy. They can accommodate the infection without a f- being affected. So they've come into balance with this Yeah, parasite. but what if you want a rainbow trout, not a brown trout? Well, then you're... <laughs> I almost said something that I was sorry for. But, you know, you could breed the rainbows to be resistant. You could. And in fact, right. if you went to the Madison River now and derived yeah. one of the adult trout sure, sure, and then made the hatchery fish based on them, then you probably solved your problem. So they say here that uh, recreational fishermen can help prevent spread by not carrying fish or equipment from one body of water to yeah, another. good luck on that. When we went canoeing upstate years ago... Forget it. They said uh, <laughs> when you would portage, right, there were signs always that said, do not transport water in your boat. Please dump it out before you get to the... What lake were they lake. worried about there? Um, probably snails. Uh, that's one. The New-, the New Zealand zebra snail is one of those that mm-hmm. they're worried about. But there's also a weed that they're worried about there. Oh, yeah? Yeah, as an as a aquatic plant. They also say um, fish bones or entrails should never be disposed of in any body of water because you'll release the spores for this parasite. And salmon and trout should not be used as bait. Would you ever use those as bait? Yes, it looks like you do. I don't use bait. You use flies, right? Yeah. I don't Who use would bait. use bait? What type of fisherman? Bait fishermen use bait <laughs> but they don't use fish for bait they use worms and stuff like that yeah i mean i have used for bait minnows minnows yeah small small fish worms sometimes squid if i'm looking for crabs squid <laughs> <laughs> but would you fish for clams right you put clams for bait yeah you could fish for uh, blackfish and uh, blackfish love clams when we go bluefish fishing uh, that's different what do they put on the bait herring or bunker yeah, right, Bunker, yeah. Bunker, and Archie a Bunker. crab with Bunker. Put Archie Bunker on it. His his wife just died. <laughs> I know. The woman who played You're right. his wife. Yeah, she was brilliant. There's a Whirling Disease Foundation. There, I told you, I, I, was, I know the guy who founded it. Really? He's a virologist. And so, in the scheme of things, yes. Dixon. Yes. Um, in the big scheme or the little scheme? <laughs> How about the big scheme? 
go on. I want to know <laughs> yes. how this fits in the big scheme of things in terms of seriousness. How serious is it? Yeah. What's a more serious disease of fish than this? Infectious pancreatitis. So some viral diseases are more serious yeah, than this. So this is serious. rather low. In fact, they close hatch- hatcheries because of All right, that. but if you owned a hatchery, you wouldn't like to have this, right? Horrible. I mean, 90% attrition. You can you can really have a horrible thing going on here. Okay. Bad. Well, um, that's whirling disease. That it? is whirling. That's a parasite that's... that's if I eat a fish with whirling disease, <sighs> parasite, fine. would I be fine? You're fine. Absolutely fine. You don't usually eat the cartilage of the fish, do you, Vince? I don't think so. No, you eat the flesh. Eat the flesh. Yeah, so the parasite's not even in the flesh. But there are other parasites there, so I should cook my fish. Absolutely. We've talked about that before. We have, or you can freeze it, of course. But, right. I, but I think that the, this raises the issue of... Uh, the reason why I like this so much, and, and the ladybird uh, story as well, is that mm. the field of parasitology is very broad. Right. All right. When you start to think about parasitology, everybody thinks about people and parasites and, and plowshares and plowshares, and <laughs> we'll talk about that next week because the book is coming Here, out. You lean forward because the wire is hitting your. Okay, sorry, Mike. I need to get you a longer wire, don't you? I um, need to give you more rope. Maybe, <laughs> or put a suction cup on my elbows or something. So you I don't move around move. a lot. I do, but that's how you are. That's my style. Style you that's talk. My style. And when you do TED talks, you move around a lot. I do. Right? I do. Don't they make a circle for you to stand they in? They do, and you have to stay in that circle. Do but you? you? But you can make the full use of the circle. Do you stay in the circle? I don't know. You can go look at them, and you'll see for yourself. They probably would have yelled at you if they hadn't. <laughs> no, they don't do that. All right. Any other things before we move on about um, the whirling disease? It's it's just another yes. One more final thought, and it's just another example of nature at work. Okay, nature at work. Everybody throws up their hands at the beginning when they hear about this new disease. They all want to do something about it. But over time, given enough, and in this case, about 20 years, whirling disease has come into balance with the native rainbow trout populations throughout the area where it's now effective. The same thing is happening now with West Nile virus. The same thing happened with small... I can, you know, the list is endless because obviously biology is biology is biology. Well, Dixon, it seems to me that everything uh, reaches some balance, yes. except when people intervene, uh, and we mess things up. But of course so we, we do. we transport fish. You look at how that happened. Mess up. Isn't West it crazy? Nile we brought here, probably. We, of course we did. Yeah. Now, we are part of nature, Yeah. right? Yeah. But the rest of nature doesn't have the sentience that we do. We can consciously say, we're going to bring this from here to That's here right. because of this. And That's so correct. Forth, so. That's correct. But the only way that a volcanic island can evolve into a lush tropical environment is the invasion of species. Yeah, invasion, spores coming in with birds or whatever. Yeah. It was one of Darwin's biggest uh, observations. What's that? Well, how volcanoes evolve into tropical yeah. islands. In fact, in his voyages, he saw all the stages of colonization, including the Galapagos. Okay. okay. We have some emails. Great. And a lot of emails. Excellent. First one is from Suzanne, who writes, your discussion about technology and fixing things here before we go out into space, you remember that? Made me wonder if space exploration might turn out to be like investigative science. In the process of exploring space, we might run across the means of fixing our problems here. Ah, so reverse it. I, I mean, I agree. I I'm sure that if we developed the means to go into space, we would discover things that we didn't anticipate. True. I mean, I'm always saying that about research, that you should yeah. do things, even if you're not sure why, just because you're interested, because good things happen. And you could certainly make the same argument for space exploration. You could. So I'm being a little bit um, contradictory in saying that we shouldn't go out into space. But I, my reason is that we don't have enough money to do what we need to do here. Yes. But I think the point I would like to make in that regard is that uh, in order to live in space, you have to provide for everything. Mm-hmm. You have to okay. provide your parasites, there's too. No, <laughs> there's no way to have a takeout pizza if you live on Mars. So when you live on Mars, you've got to provide your own food, water, atmosphere, everything. And the moment we learn how to do that, we can apply those solutions to other situations on Earth. Yeah. And so that I think that's exactly. the, that's the good thing here, Dixon. If you learned that there were life on another planet, would it matter to you? Of course, it would. 
Why? Yeah, because I would be excited about that. I would like to. But know you what it would never like. ever be able to encounter that. I don't even know. Too far away. We don't have the way the means to travel, and the communication takes thousands of years. Well, how did we find out it was there then? Well, let's say we got some radio broadcast, right, with some patterns that are clearly, right. you know, some form of life. It was probably sent thousands of years ago. It would make me wonder. And like those people crazy. may be dead. That's and true. if you answer them, they're not going to get it for another. You'll be gone long no, no, <laughs> before no, they get no. it. So wait a minute, wait a it's irrelevant. Wait a minute. We had the discussion. Did, were you part of this? <laughs> yes, discussion I was. The other day? Sure, I was. Sure. Our colleague Steve Goff said, "Yeah, yeah, that's right." Would, if if we found that there were life elsewhere, it would make a huge impact on Earth. But I said, I don't think it would make any. No, impact. I think it would change people's thoughts about religion. For instance, he he said it would make us realize we're not the center of the universe. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we all know that's true now, but. Uh, we're not even close to being the center. But remember, our radio waves have now reached the nearest planetary system, mm -hmm. six light years away. So as you start to think about this, how many systems, if, if we've been doing this for about 100 years, mm -hmm. that's how many? How many star systems have we uh, gone through? So now in another 100 years, we might get an answer. Huh? You don't know. Uh, anyway. You don't know. I don't think. I think I would be very excited. Well, to me, I, I think would be most. Very I mean, there are a lot of people on Earth who would be amazed and I would be very love excited. it, but there are lots of people who wouldn't care. They it can't. would force you to think about yourself in another completely different way. You're not the only one. You're well, I, I don't know. One. I don't think of myself as the only one anyway. So. <laughs> no, you're one of seven billion. Yeah, but a lot of this other is not the only planet. It doesn't matter. For me, it doesn't matter. Oh, but okay. But That's anyway, I'd fair. be interested in what our listeners think. Are you not uh, attracted to science fiction? I love science fiction. Well, that's what it's all about. But there's no longer fiction if there's another <laughs> planet of people. <laughs> uh, I guess you can still write fictional novels about it. Uh, Robin writes, yes. Ecology and Parasites. Uh -huh. Just as weeds are plants that seemingly have no use for us but interfere with our attempts to cultivate plants in controlled ecosystems set up by us, parasites are organisms that interfere with the controlled ecosystems that constitute organisms but seemingly have no use in the limited perspective of human timescales. Parasites may have substantial functions in shaping natural ecosystems such as in controlling population overgrowth, helping in modulating immune systems, as in preventing autoimmune bowel disease in humans with intestinal parasites, and in building herd immunity, which was lacking in New World humans to Old World viruses, causing New World human populations to be wiped out on contact with Old World humans, and quite possibly other influences as yet unrecognized. Extermination of wolves, perceived in the same light as parasites, caused an overgrowth of herbivores, altering plant populations, and affecting the ecology of streams and rivers. Parasites can have effects on human social structures, as when Black Death so reduced surf populations that they brought an end to the structures of medieval serfdom in Europe. We have been around for 200,000 years and have had an understanding of the organisms we call parasites, but for a couple of centuries. Our attempts to reshape natural ecosystems to what we see as our advantage in our time frames may have unintended consequences on evolutionary and geological timescales. Parasites and hosts are in a dynamic dance with ecosystems, a dance that contributes to shaping the ecosystems over various timescales of which we see but a few frames, and even a small part within each of those frames. This is so well exemplified in virology, where we have only recently come to recognize that our very existence now depends on ancient viruses that melded our genomes. What does this uh, person do for a living, do you think? He's a retired emergency room physician. Right. He, uh, he listens to all of our no, podcasts. No, no, I remember, I remember. And he writes often. He's an he's eloquent, thinking. eloquent he's thinking. writer. He's so he sent um, <clears throat> this, this uh, blog called Parasite Ecology. Oh, nice. And um, Lovely. Uh, uh, look at that. All, all right. sorts of posts and interesting things here. Get your mix of boluses in there someplace. <laughs> so we'll, we'll, we'll put that in there. He also sent a link to um, this article in a separate email. The, queen, the Red Queen was right. Ah, right. Life must continually evolve to avoid extinction. Right. Right? Yep. Sure. 100%. Uh, this is all about uh, the death of individual species shouldn't be the only concern for biologists worried about animal groups such as frogs or big cats 
a new emerging species also contributes to extinction. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you get that? I do. It's not it only the ones that are something. going away. It has to replace something. All right, thank you, Robin. Blaine writes, hi there, Twippies. Twippies. So this interesting link on the USDA website discussing the work of Eric Hoberg on the origins of tapeworms. Huh. And this is... Um, Oh, it's on it's on the USDA out of Africa, the origins of tapeworms. Right. right. And here he is. This is Eric Hoberg. Mm-hmm. And uh, I guess he's interested in their origins. As are a lot of other people. Where what is their origin, Dixon? <laughs> You're asking the wrong person. Really? <laughs> well That's not my field. Uh Blaine says I would love to hear you guys interview Eric or have a podcast discussing the origins evolution of some of these parasites. I find it remarkable to think about these complex life cycles and how these parasites require two or more hosts to survive. It just doesn't seem like a great strategy for survival, other than the fact that it does seem to work. (laughs) Not just work. Some of them work really good, like malaria, for instance. This leads to a lot of questions about how or where these things ever came from regarding tapeworms that use domesticated animals as part of their life cycles. Yeah, well, if they're now in domesticated animals, they probably were in a wild animal of course. before, right? Of course. One or more questions that you may or may not have hinted on in your podcast. Do parasites have parasites or commensals? We have talked about We've that. We've talked about I'm that. Sure we have. Remember the Jonathan Swift quote? Yes. Well, give me an example of a parasite with a parasite. Um, Gregorines infect a lot of different invertebrates. For instance, uh, we have viruses of parasites. We've talked about them already. Double stranded RNA yes, viruses. Said there must be bacteria and viruses that infect or live on parasites. Uh, Bajaria, Is anyone Bajaria. studying them? Can you comment on this too? Sure. So there are certainly viruses a, of parasites. Trichomonas viruses, for example. Because of the toll like receptor triggers that, mm-hmm. that the viruses uh, uh, elicit, which inflames the uh, uterine wall and allows the trichomonas to succeed better. Are there bacteria of parasites? Endosymbionts. You bet there are. Wolbachia. Remember we discussed uh, Uncacirca? Remember that? Um, River blindness. So Wolbachia is in Uncacirca? Yes, it is. Oh, okay. And if you cure it, the pathology of Uncacirca goes away. We discussed that on TWIP. We did. Episode right. number two. No, it wasn't number two. It was something like... <laughs> uh, Blaine, go back and listen. Yeah. Well, you go to microbeworld.org slash TWIP. And you can get a list of all the episodes. So, Vince, week. what's the most amazing thing you heard last week that you startled us with? Well, we did a paper on TWIM about the finding of bacteria in our brains. Right. Bacteria in human brains. I can't believe that. Can you believe that? Still? TWIM. Uh, Do you believe that? So, the, what they did is they initially wanted to look in people with AIDS where the blood brain barrier is compromised. And they said, well, the brain is supposed to be sterile. Is it still sterile in people with AIDS? And their controls were people who died of various other diseases. And uh, they had pieces of their brain. And they all had bacteria in them, which they discovered by sequencing. And they are alpha proteobacteria, which tend to be intracellular and bacteria. Every single brain had this. Every brain, of they looked at 20 or so. I mean, miliary tuberculosis. You can get tuberculosis of the brain. Well, yeah, when you get diseased, you can get infections, <clears throat> or obviously. Or toxoplasma but, of the brain. Yeah, but um, these but seem these to be... But these are normal bacteria, well, or normal endosymbionts? They seem to be present in every human specimen they looked at. And they looked for lipopolysaccharide, right? They also stained sections with the antibodies to... Um, LPS. And peptidoglycan, I think. And they co-localized something that looks like bacteria within cells. It's remarkable. They also made extracts of the brain and injected into mice, and the bacteria colonized the mouse brain. Nice. It didn't kill them. They were fine. And the same bacteria that were in the people. So the brain has a microbiome. I think so. Wow. But one of our listeners wrote in just this morning and criticized it. Because? He said they didn't try and culture the microorganisms. Well, they're not possible to culture. Many of them are not culturable, yeah. So, I don't know. I think the fact that you could give it to mice is quite interesting, but also that it was in every specimen. Now, every one of these individuals had some disease. Ah. All right. So, it would be nice. It's a hard one to get healthy brain pieces, right? Unless you get someone well, who automobile just... Automobile accidents. Yeah, I know, but you... It's not hard at all. It's easy. It's very easy. Yeah. Too easy. Anyway, I think it's a provocative result. I don't know that it is correct yet. 
and I think we were somewhat circumspect about it. But clearly, people are going to be re-examining this. Absolutely. Right? Because you can imagine. I mean, someone else wrote in and said, why are you surprised the insects have bacteria in their brains? Yeah, but their brains are exposed to hemolymph. There's, mm-hmm. there's an open circulation there. I mean, it's incredibly uh, different. There's no barrier, as in humans, yeah. None. Anyway, Blaine is from Canada. Thank wow. you, Blaine. Yeah. John writes, in TWIP 51, you speculated about the effect of wing muscle modifications on mating success in mosquitoes. That was Anthony James. Right. The subject of wing beats and mating has been studied in the related family Chironomidae. Chironomidae. Thanks. That's what I said. (laughs) Both families share an enlarged Johnston's organ, hearing organ. It's at the base of the antennae. Yeah, in the male antenna. Chironomidae are abundant and don't try to eat researchers, so they make better tests. (laughs) This is true. This is true. Males of most species form aerial mating swarms and listen for the wing beat frequency of females of the same species. I doubt females listen for individual males because they lack modified antennae. They may hear the swarm, and males could listen to each other to form into a compact swarm. A male of one of the larger lake-dwelling species might metaphorically say to a female, quote, Meet me five meters over a contrasting dark object on the sandy beach at dusk when light has dropped below 50 lux. Beat your wings at 370 hertz, adjusted by 10 hertz per degree centigrade of ambient air temperature above or below 20 degrees centigrade. I'll be waiting with a million of my friends. That's very difficult to text. End quote. <laughs> That's great. He's saying it metaphorically. Yeah. Imagine how long that insect would be there texting. The combination of swarm, marker, altitude, and wing beat frequency is different for different species. And he cites a paper by Ogawa and Sato in 1993, Relationship Between Male Acoustic Response and Female Wing Beat Frequency in a Chironomid Midge, Chironomus Yoshimatsui. Wow. So, I have a question for you, Vince. It's a trivial question. Let me finish. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. To tie this back to parasitism, here's a picture I took of some ectoparasitic water mites on a midge. Ectoparasitic water mites on a midge. Okay. Oh, this is beautiful. Oh, they're gorgeous. Here's the midge. Yep. In yellow yeah. with black eyes. Yeah, 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 yeah. In the red are the ectoparasitic. They're gorgeous. Are they sucking blood? They're sucking hemolymph. Is that why it's red? Hemolymph, no. Hemolymph is not red. What is it? It's clear. Okay. He doesn't look happy with these midges. No? no they would never be happy with that. So I have a question. What are the midges doing to this poor... No, the other way. What are the parasites doing to this poor midge? Well, they're taking advantage of a successful system, Vince. <laughs> John. So this is John. So Chironomids, I want to... Oh, look, he's got all these nature pictures. Nice. Uh, Sounds like he's an ecologist. Well, he, cer- he certainly knows about wing beats. There's his feeding mosquito. It is a feeding mosquito. Berlin. What is angle is he at? She. Uh, he's slightly she. elevated. She. 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 she are the only ones only that she... she. Is that an 80s species? Uh, can you see any patterns on the wing? Can't. Wing is obscuring it. So if there's no pattern, it's not an, uh, it's not an Anopheles. Huh. Okay. Right? If there so is we, a pattern. So midges, chironomids, those are midges. Chironomids. The adult is the called a midge, and mm-hmm. the chironomid larvae, okay, are found in fresh water. Okay. So here's what they did with you wonder why you should even know about these things, right? What good are they? They're just part of nature. Who cares? So you know where Oak Ridge, Tennessee is, right? Yeah, it's in Tennessee. Do you know, <laughs> do you know anything about it? Uh, there's some national laboratory there, and right? What do they do? Nuclear bombs. Yep, <laughs> they purify uranium. Really, they have centrifuges. Well, the better they do. technology. They do. They do. they do. they do. They do. He takes a lot of pictures of squirrels. He does. Look maybe the dragon a spider. That's a, what is that? That orange guy. It looks like a mite. It might be a mite. How many legs? How many legs? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It's a mite. It's a it's arthropod, a mite. right? <laughs> No, it's an arachnid. An arachnid? <laughs> My son asked me the other day, I said, how many legs do uh, arachnids? Like arachnids. I, said, I did the Dixon two-handed thing. Excellent. So, he takes nice pictures. He does. Say, back to Oak Ridge, sorry. 
No, no, I wanted to, to follow up on the chironomids. Yeah. Because, you know, we, we divert off to various, and we were talking about tube effect swarms. Yeah. And they're found in freshwater also. So chironomids are found, and they're found in, in the entire uh, aquatic environments of freshwater. Wherever you go in the world, you can find chironomids, okay? So fruit flies and chironomids have something in common. They have polyteen chromosomes. Mm-hmm. So can you, you can, tell, tell everyone what polyteen means? Well, it's, it's a multiplicity of the same chromosome so that when you make a squash, you can see the bands in the chromosomes very easily. Polyteen chromosomes are oversized chromosomes which have developed from standard chromosomes and are commonly found in the salivary glands of Drosophila. And chironomids. Okay. Okay, so what good is that? So what they did was they did a study of the effects of radiation on the DNA arrangements in polyteen chromosomes, in chironomids. Okay. And they studied it at the above Oak Ridge, at Oak Ridge, and all the way down to New Orleans. And they found that the further away from Oak Ridge you got, the, the less crossover results you got. So that by the time you got to New Orleans, the chromosomes were almost normal again. Mm-hmm. But it showed the effects, the graded effects, of the release of radioactivity into the right. environment, which was a big deal back in the 1950s and 60s because people were really worried about that then, and we still are. And so chironomids played a big role in uh, yeah, cool. determining it. The other one that did it is the spheroid clam. It's a little clam about the size of your pinky. Mm-hmm. And they looked for strontium-90. Uh, they found it? And the, the, the most they found was at the Oak Ridge Laboratory wow. Facilities, which meant that he was leaking radiation, right? Sometimes we're not <clears throat> sure that. Sometimes we don't do the right thing. Because if you say, ask them, you know, are you guys leaking radiation? They would say, of course not. Are they lying? Or they just don't know? Oh, no. They were lying. Uh, they were lying because if they said yes, then they would have to fix it. Yeah. Well, someone decided to do the study to prove that they were lying, and that's what they found. Then they had to fix it. And now that there's not, that doesn't exist anymore. Dixon, technology is a double-edged sword. It's yes. It has allowed us to do many things, but it's also dangerous, and we have to balance it. Very true. But in our development, yes. you know, when we first make a technology, we're sort of ignoring the dangers, and then yeah, many years right. later, it's you are right. really fine. That so I just got back from France. Do you know how much energy they generate by nuclear a power? A lot. 75%. Yeah, you drive around France, that's all you see are uh, nuclear towers. It's amazing. Like cooling towers, yeah. What are they going to do when they decommission all those, those uh, they'll facilities? Think they'll worry about it when that happens. It's going to happen soon. Uh, Joe writes, Joe Vince, writes, Vincent Dick, as always, I love your podcast. <coughs> you all made me laugh in TWIP episode 55 with Dick's comment about the foreign nature of chemical engineers' brains and Vince's postmodern nonsense about the evils of the internal combustion engine and denigrating it because it was just so cheap. Did we talk about things like that? Yeah, I we can't did. even remember. <laughs> well, we're going, I, I understand that. We're glad it's a we're good making thing, but let, Let's read Joe's letter. Please. Let me take you on a brief tour of how this chemie brain sees the world. The development of mechanical power to replace human and animal power is one of the single most important advances in human history. You may have heard of it. It is called the Industrial Revolution. (laughs) The rise of mechanical power is arguably the single biggest reason for the economic and moral decline of slavery as a viable social model on most of the planet. Slavery was rampant in the birthplace of democracy, ancient Greece, and not seen to be incompatible as it freed up the rich folks to have time to think deep thoughts. Mechanical power ranks right up there with the invention of writing, cities, mathematics, and the scientific method as the most impactful events in our history that have enabled us to reach the incredible quality of life we have today. It has certainly had a much greater impact on the world than modern medicine or electronics, both of which I value highly. The internal combustion engine in its various forms, two-stroke, four-stroke, gas, and diesel, is one of the single most successful inventions in history. It has beat out water power, steam power, coal-fired boiler power, or any other options in almost all applications, with a few notable exceptions like centralized electricity generation. It's dependable, cheap, easy to repair, durable, and scalable. This is the highest praise an engineer can give. 
It has filled every available power generation niche in almost every conceivable human habitat and pushed its competitors to extinction. Here's a short list. Weed whackers, leaf blowers, motorcycles, cars, buses, trucks, tractors, trains, diesel, electric locomotives, ships, airplanes, portable generators, portable pumps, and air compressors. One of the most amazing things about the IC, internal combustion engine, is that it has dominated applications where capital outlay is small with accompanying higher high operating costs, small engines, right on up to those larger applications where capital outlay is very high with relatively lower operating costs, locomotives, semi-trucks, and medium-sized ships. Only at the very largest scales where turbine engines have an advantage do they lose out. Think E. coli the size of an elephant for comparable <laughs> biological example. Imagine life in any city with large city without the IC engine. The quality of life drops dramatically. Public transit, food delivery, waste disposal, etc., all depend on the IC engine. I leave it to Dick to discuss the health and comfort impacts of all of us going back to horses. <laughs> Don't mind the flies and careful where you step. <laughs> yes, I know fuel cells and hybrids are so much cooler. Someday they may be one-tenth as durable and successful as the IC engine. Some personal history will give some perspective. I started in an industrial R&D department in 1981, fresh out of college, and I thought it was really great that about half of the R&D budget for this chemical company was going to develop membrane technology, a.k.a. microporous separators for use in electrochemical cells, which are essentially fuel cells running in reverse. We all saw the promise of the technology even then. They finally gave up years and many dollars later with little progress. The state of field has changed little since then, and you can make the argument that this is a problem on the order of difficulty of our efforts to cure cancer. The devil is most certainly in the details. We engineers will keep working on these new technologies because that is how our brains are wired, and there are some incredible advantages if we can ever make them work. But don't disparage the IC engine until you can show me one of these new solutions going 200,000 miles over 10 years without several major rebuilds like several, like so many old trucks and cars do every day. Realize that the telling measure is that people are only shocked when an IC engine breaks down much sooner. If you stop and think about it, we all literally depend on IC engines on a daily basis in many ways. So the only real question is, have you hugged your engine today? <laughs> all my best, you folks make my daily ride behind my IC engine a treat <laughs> and are greatly appreciated. Joe, P.S. Yes, machines are alive, just like viruses. You know, um, so I, w I think last time I was disparaging the IC engine as causing all of our problems, pollution, using up resources. What happens in 50 years when we don't have oil to run these IC engines anymore, though? But I think you will have oil in 50 years from now, unfortunately. With all the fracking that's going on, they'll, they'll find it. Always finding more ways. Finding so more it ways. is true that the IC engine has revolutionized the world. No question. But it's also true that it's made problems, right? Correct. But he so, would say that the problems are far yeah. over overshadowed by all the good things. Well, uh, and he uh, may be, but this is an engineer's view, right? Yeah, but engineers I, always like. Sorry, Dixon. Technology. Okay. <laughs> go okay. ahead. Go ahead. I see engines don't have to just run on the fossil fuels, though. You could run them on bio biofuels. So if you ran them on biofuels, like they do in, let's say, Brazil, with uh, ethanol. Uh, okay. You what gotta, do you think of that, Joe? Yeah, Joe, what do you think of that? Biofuels okay? Sure. Or is that, or is that garbage? It's a zero-carbon footprint. He will write us a letter. Anyway, that was great. Thank you, Joe. Right. I only have two more, so let's finish them. Sure. Amanda writes, hey, guys, avid fan here, love all your podcasts, weather updates, and especially Dixon's digressions. Just a teeny correction from TWIP55. A listener, Jesse, picked the board game Pandemic. Unfortunately, you confused the board game with the Flash Internet game Pandemic 2. Uh. Minor, I know, but I don't want you or any listeners to miss out on the board game by thinking <laughs> it's the same as the Flash game. The two games, while equally awesome, are completely different. In Pandemic 2, the Internet Flash game and iPhone app, you build your pathogen and try to decimate the world through disease. In the board game Pandemic, you work with three of your friends to eliminate four different diseases, developing cures, and thwarting outbreaks. The game has a few levels of difficulty, and the expansion brings new elements like a mutated strain, a bioterrorist role, and even Petri dishes to keep your game pieces in. That's cool. 
I highly recommend it. I was wary about the cooperative element, but it's a blast. If I may, I'll submit the expansion as a listener pick, Pandemic on the Brink. Also, for those that love Pandemic 2, there is a f- iPhone, iPad, iTouch app out there called the Plague Incorporated that is very similar but with a slightly nicer interface. 15 degrees Celsius and rainy here in Halifax, Nova Scotia, Halifax. which is in Canada. Indeed. Amanda is a postdoc at the Canadian Center for Vaccinology in Halifax. Nice. Uh, did you did you see my son's review of uh, pandemic? Maybe maybe it wasn't pandemic. I um, didn't. In Twiv number seven. Way back. It was way it was back. Way way. Twiv number seven viruses in video games. Right. Uh, that was you're gonna blanch when I tell you this was November seventh, two thousand and eight. Good lord. Pandemic two. He talked about Amanda. You should check out his Get him back on to bring it up to date. And our last, um, you know, yeah, he would have a different perspective now, I think. He would be very good, but he doesn't do these. uh, He has very specific games that he plays. He's matured. No, he's different. He has matured also. And the last one is from Judith, who writes, My husband discovered Twim for me. It was at... Love at First Podcast. <laughs> I'm retired after a wonderful and exciting 40-plus year career in public health in San Luis Obispo, California. Oh, nice place. I've tried to keep up with internet articles, but your podcast bring me back to, into the latest happenings in such an entertaining manner. Having gone through all the twims, I am now into the twips. I love all of the regulars and am amazed at the collective depth of knowledge. I have a strong background in evolution and ecology and love when you put the pathogens in their places in the big picture. Excellent. My ecology was my greatest love. Would enjoy uh. a twiff. Maybe you could <laughs> clone yourself, Vincent. I'd love to do this week in fungi. Yeah. Just got to find someone to do it with. Well. Question. Why this week in parasitism rather than this week in parasitology for uniformity? Dixon. You picked it. No, you wanted to do parasitology, not... I did. I'm sorry. No, I did. Parasitism, not parasitology. No, no, I said parasitology. But ology is no, just No, you a- said parasitism because it was, a, it was a way of thinking, not a field. Ology limits you. Yes, that's, that was your thing. Well, you go back to one and you'll see you're saying that. Me? I didn't pick parasitism. I didn't even know what parasitism was. Hey. Hey. <laughs> so parasitism is... The act of being a parasite. It could be right. viral, it could be of course. eukaryotic, it could but be. parasitology is a very specific field. It is. It doesn't include viruses, right? Nope. Or fungi. And she sends a link to an article. Uh, she says, I just found this article. It is heartening that microbes are working hard to fix our messes. <laughs> this is a Science Daily article. Science discover thriving colonies of microbes in the ocean plastisphere. Scientists have discovered a diverse multitude of microbes colonizing and thriving on flecks of plastic that have polluted the oceans, a vast new human-made flotilla of microbial communities that they have dubbed the plastisphere. You know, all this plastic floating around in the ocean. I I think we talked about this on a twip. You said... There aren't really these big collections of plastic floating around, but little bits. I never said that. No, I think Alan actually said that, Alan Dove. Might have said that. So these are bacteria, which you're not surprising that these have well, you're doing them a home. and they're degrading it, right? You gave them a home. Gave them a home. And a, res- and a resource. Many thanks for all the hours of enlightenment, Judy. Thanks, everybody, for your letters. If you want to send a letter in, we'd love to read it. Send them to twip at twiv.tv. And this episode will be found at microbeworld.org slash twip or on iTunes. And if you like twip, Go to, go over to iTunes and leave a review. I still have to figure out how to give a link to the review section. But that helps us to stay visible. Of all three podcasts, TWIP is kind of not so visible. Really? If we had more people commenting and leaving reviews, yep. even just giving it five stars, it would move up a little <laughs> bit. <laughs> You're pandering now, Vincent. You're pandering. No, we don't want money. We just want praise. <laughs> Or criticism. Or criticism. You know, there's nothing... Constructive. There's no such thing as bad publicity. Correct. Just spell our names right. 
Dixon Day Palmier can be found at trichinella.org, verticalfarm.com, and medicalecology.com. Thank you, Dixon. Welcome, Vincent. Whirling disease. That was fun. Yep. A whirling dervish. Hey, could we make that the title? Sure. What is a whirling dervish? A whirling der- a dervish is a religious um, sect in Turkey that practices an ancient religion. And in order to go into a trance, they twirl, right? It's mostly right. um, practiced by men, as I recall. Oh, that's not a good title for this episode. But it's outlawed, right? It's, it's illegal to really? be a whirling dervish. That's right. It is this... It's like a... I don't know why it's illegal in Turkey because uh, everyone thinks of it. Uh, we'll just they, call this whirling disease. How's that? No, no, I'd like to call this now for something completely different. Why? Because this is a different parasite than the ones we've been discussing in the past. Yeah, but it's still a parasite. Of, but of course, but it's such a different parasite. Hmm. I mean, this is really not on the fringe of what we've been talking about, but this is a, a, a mesozoan parasite. Not a metazoan parasite, not a protozoan. Mesozoan. It's a mesozoan parasite. Should we call it a mesozoan parasite? We should call it a mesozoan parasite. Would that be happy? Make I, happy? Well, it would make them happy, I think, because... A, a meso... meso a, wait a minute, I hit the caps lock. M-E-S-O-Z-O-A-N parasite. Mesozoan parasite. Well, I guess we could call it mixozan, mixobolus... Cerebralis, a mesozoan parasite. How's that? <laughs> That's pretty direct. Cerebralis, a mesozoan. You see how the titles evolve here at I the WIP? I Yes. <laughs> Al- Alan you, is much better at we this. We let you in <laughs> on everything. You know what the, epi- the name of our last TWIP was, by you, the way? Tell me. I'm sorry I missed it. Filterable camels. Filterable camels. You get it? I got it, I got it. Because mirrors coronavirus, some camels have been implicated in transmitting it, and camels are cigarettes, and yes. viruses are filterable, and camels have filters. Alan, Alan has a weird mind. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a good mind, by the way, but it's just, uh, it's, it's as different as Mixabolus. You think you have a non-weird mind? Well, in a way, I, I have a pretty ordinary brain, I think. Yeah. You do play trombone. Yeah, poorly. I have a recording of it. <laughs> you do? Yeah, I took it at your. You recorded that? I recorded it oh on my, my phone. I'm going to put it on the website oh, one of these do that. days. I shouldn't do that. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. The music you hear on TWIP is composed and performed by Ronald Jenkins. You can find his work at ronaldjenkins.com. You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another twip is is parasitic. parasitic.